so there's one detail that I think a lot of us have wondered. Now, we never saw it on screen, and it might not have been intended to be on the screen, but, but talk us through it. Was this ship originally intended to source separate, like the D? Was it ever considered to do it in the movies, or was it something you had to add later on because the fans really wanted to see it? Or was it something you definitely had in mind the whole time? Um, we drew it with a saucer separation, but it was always designed that way because all the Enterprises up to that point had that feature. And uh, at one tiny moment, it was discussed that it was going to happen in first contact. And they decided it was too much to do. It was going to be basically the crew escaped on the saucer while the board were in the body. And they thought with the Phoenix going on and the battle with, De with Zeta and the board queen and all that, it was just too much. So uh, they pulled that whole scene out. But it was designed to separate. Uh, the same thing was originally going to be uh, penciled in with Nemesis, and it didn't work out. So never got to see the two except in one whole unit. Uh, one thing that has always intrigued me is that the Enterprise uh, was changed or refitted for each TNG movie. <laughs> uh, the length was subtly altered and new de details were added when the script called for them. Now, do you want to talk us through some of those changes and why they occurred and if you were part of the process each time with that? Yeah, uh, originally with First Contact, ILM makes a scale chart and everything. We, we go through this entire chart, we make the scales for everything, and they do whatever they can to make that that fly together. So everything in, in one shot will have the exact same scale. When it went to insurrection, um, we uh, didn't have necessarily a main effects supervisor. So we had one of the gentlemen from uh, Deep Space Nine working on it. And um, he didn't really particularly care about scale. He wanted the shots to look the best. And uh, he didn't think it was that important to, to keep that kind of uh, uh, size comparison together. So when you see it flying alongside the collector, it goes anywhere from a ship that's maybe mm, 3,500 feet to a couple miles at the final shot when it's scraping the top of it. So it's very, very obvious that there was no scale <laughs> at all. And we had drawn a, a scale chart of everything. And we always did it for every show. And when it got to the, the, uh, whoever was doing the effect shots, uh, it would kind of depend on them what would happen. And, so, uh, and the poor Santa Barbara guys, they were dying. They, they hadn't had that much experience with this kind of stuff. And so you'll see some models that hadn't even been colored yet. They're still the, the render gray and they were fighting. They were just fighting for time and uh, they just weren't ready for it. So poor guys just were tortured 24 hours a day <laughs> until the movie came out. But that, that, that particular one was very, very big with not showing any type of scale whatsoever. When I went to Nemesis, I went to Digital Domain and uh, all those guys were very conscious of scale and direction and stuff. So uh, they made sure all of that stuff worked. And uh, it was it was awesome. Jay Barton was in charge of the the E model, so he built the computer generated model of the Enterprise E. And everything kind of scattered amongst the rest of his crew, but he was very conscious of what that ship was going to look like. Um, that one actually afforded, uh, from my point of view, a point to fix things that I didn't didn't uh, not that I didn't like, but I thought I could tweak or, or add a little bit of, of things because when we were doing the uh, first contact model, the big uh, the big model. Rick Sternbach did the plans, and before he finished the, the struts, he went on to another show. So he, his blueprints are only of the body, the saucer, and that's it. And so ILM made up the, the difference of the two. And when you see a profile of that ship, the nasals are very low, and the struts are very low. And so it, there was a flow in the, the designs that we were doing, and it kind of got lost. There's a kind of a notch, and then, then the nasals are too low. So they let me kind of correct that with, with Nemesis, and working with Jay was great. So... So good, which, good version, which version is this then? Yes, exactly. Is that too low, or, or is that the one you corrected? Uh, that model that you have there was actually they just kind of re uh, recast the uh, the uh, other models, yeah. and so uh, it it reflects the first contact view. It doesn't show the the nemesis corrections. Oh, it's good to know actually. Was, mm -hmm. there, was there any other subtle details you added? Maybe more torpedoes, maybe more... Well, the captain's yacht. I mean, was that in all three? I mean, were there any specific details that, that you added technically between the three versions? Yeah, all the, all the scripts called for something new. Yeah. And with uh, Insurrection, we had the, uh, the captain's yacht. And just ironically, the torpedo launcher, everything we needed was, was there uh, accidentally. <laughs> so there were these little, little black uh, kind of rectangles that kind of... Uh, connect the torpedo launcher to the bay, and it worked out perfect to be the strut. So the only thing we had to do is kind of do an outline of where the nacelles would kind of tuck into the bottom of the uh, the saucer there. And that was the only change we had to do. We had to reroute the torpedo launcher because basically it fired right above the nose of the uh, of the uh, of the yacht. 
That and so uh, he came up with this, this re idea. So uh, the Cushman brothers had done this cutaway, and um, so I was trying to make their their drawing work as well. So we did a, a scenario where instead of the torpedo launching and shooting through a tube out that uh, torpedo launcher, we have it drop directly at the at the mouth of that thing where it would fire. So that sweep of the captain's yacht wouldn't interfere with the torpedo launcher, so everything would fit and correlate properly. And that was about the biggest change we had to do on um, insurrection. When it came to Nemesis, we were looking at the armament of the of the Enterprise, and it was all forward-facing uh, phasers and, uh, and torpedo launchers. And the script called for mostly being attacked from the rear. So what we did is we added a whole bunch of strips and uh, rear torpedo launchers and on top of the ship as well on the bottom to compensate for what it didn't have earlier. So it would kind of progress as we went. Yeah, so I'm a really big fan of the EE. I think it's got an elegant yet aggressive sleekness that I think works really well. But obviously there are many concept designs that you had for the EE, and I want to get into one specifically than what's right next to us. It's got those thinner forward-facing nacelle struts, and I think you meant well, it's the one you mentioned earlier. Um, and mm. the uh, in the drawing that we've got, the nacelle is actually meant to go up and down like the, the Intrepid class or the Voyager. So talk us through some other concepts you had that may be rejected, and then this one in particular. Yeah, with the, with the EE, I hadn't seen Voyager at that point. So it was just an accident, again, that that architecture kind of followed the Voyager with the sweeping uh, saucer going more uh, uh, a forward-facing direction as opposed to wind. And um, when Rick came over, Herman knew this already, and so he just assumed that I was kind of connecting the two together and later came out and goes, oh, I thought you knew. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the Voyager was a whole different departure, but he had brought up at one point that the nacelles could move as well. And so we had it where the uh, where the struts would uh, be in their uh, their V position when they're flying, but they would lay flat, and the nacelles would hinge, so they wouldn't they wouldn't kind of rotate crooked. They'd always constantly in that uh, that upright position, so they would move. Unlike the Voyagers that were kind of attached, so they were more symmetrical and kind of that design flow work. But for the 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 E, we had to make sure that those would hinge, so they would move the whole time, kind of like a drafting arm. Uh, they felt it wasn't necessary. With the with the ship, so uh, it was it was an idea. So we, most of the stuff we do in the art department is to say yes or no to. And so when, after looking at it, you, go, you know it's not necessary. It's not story specific. We don't need it, and we'll just stick with what's been there before. That a stationary nacelle platform that doesn't move and is always permanently placed the way it is is, is the decision. Plus, it complicates the model build too, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, another interesting with the E. It's the first Enterprise, I think since Matt Jeffries, that did not have the Aztec paint pattern on the saucer. And uh, we just never had time to draw, kind of draw that design. And so it came after the fact. We were going to do it in Nemesis. Nemesis wasn't originally supposed to be the last TNG movie. And so it was going to live again, and we were designing the Aztec paint job and all kinds of stuff for it that just never passed the drawing stage. But uh, it was going to get Aztec in the end. So were there any radical different variations to the e-design maybe early on that you just didn't that just weren't that just weren't said no to and you couldn't carry on on that you maybe wished had be on there uh. um the original ones we did a round saucer and we just thought maybe kind of fun to go back to that and it didn't it didn't work after having the d as as uh, kind of set in stone of what that kind of future architecture was going to look like so we went through changes from being a round saucer to being short to being long um some some were actually extremely long, and uh, it just it just does not doesn't work. So that's why the sketches kind of come together. And we did this one profile that worked out. It had real sweet sleek lines, had the shorter nacelles. But Herman, I ran into Herman. He goes, "Yeah, I think that might be the idea to go." So we did just one more quick pass and uh, took it to, over to Mr. Berman, and he thought it was the right direction. So we started going with it. And there was always a time frame on these drawings, and he, Herman needed two color drawings real quick. So we just threw together. Two color drawings, they had nothing to do with what the E was going to look like, but it was an earlier sketch, and those just went over just as an appeasement. So uh, uh, those, those I've noticed get published a lot, but they really had nothing to do <laughs> with what the, what the vinyl design was going to be. There were earlier stuff that just didn't, didn't click. So, Well, as you mentioned earlier, that, that Nemesis wasn't supposed to be the last movie, and that you're, you're adding aztec and stuff to the Enterprise. Now, we know it got a major refit at the end of Nemesis with new color of hull plating. And we've heard rumors about other changes that were planned. Now, do you know about any of the potential upgrades or changes that were going to be in the fourth gen uh, next generation movie? Uh, there was a lot of stuff that didn't happen. John Logan's script called for all kinds of stuff. The Scorpion fighters you see in the Nemesis. There's actually at one point where the Starship Enterprise had its own battleships in, in the hangars. 
and that was going to be a, a scene that uh, would give the Scorpion something to fight against. That that scene went away. Uh, we didn't know that the movie was going to be the last one, but the executives did. And so that was news. We didn't realize that was happening until they were throwing the sets away, because they never throw sets away. So they had a bulldozer tearing them down, and uh, we go, uh-oh, something's not right here. We found out it was the last movie, and that's why we figured out most of the stuff was getting cut. So that was cut out. Um, uh, we were actually going to show the lower shuttle bay on the fuselage that you never see. That was going to be a big scene. So um, the upper deck, we were gonna, actually going to see the inside of it, the upper shuttle bay. So all the things you never seen before, we were designing all of those things. Um, thankfully, to the uh, ships the line calendar, all that stuff kind of kind of lives. So you can see inside of the bay, you can see the fighters, you can see all that stuff that never came to be in the films. And what about in the fourth movie? What what we plan to go forward with? You know, extra. Oh, uh, the fourth movie, we didn't have any idea. We just uh, we just knew that we were doing stuff for Nemesis, and it would probably be a, something we'd see in the fourth movie, but never went anywhere. So this is a Stuart question, but I've got it because it's my turn in the script. So why did you choose to change the iconic deflector dish from blue to the yellowy orange? Uh, it's a big change, I John. Really, it's a big change. <laughs> I really didn't have anything to do with that. So uh, that kind of came out in the effects world. So <laughs> so there you go. They chose the color on that one. Sorry to say. They had nothing to do with it. And before we go, here is the buck of the study model that we built for ILM. So uh, it's a pretty big model, it's all put together, it's about 32 inches. This particular one, if you can see, it has scribes and windows and details. And this was uh, when we built the first contact version for ILM, it was completely smooth, there was no detail at all. And uh, we go plated it for the observation lounge. But when um, we needed a, a, a desktop model for uh, insurrection, we took it a little bit further, added the detail to it. And uh, this was the desktop model. Wound up not being used or seen. Same with first contact. They're in there, but you never see them. And so uh, that was this one. And so when Nemesis came along, we brought that model into the director, had it on the set. He watched and he goes, oh, wouldn't it be better if that was clear? And the, it, it was supposed to shoot. That set was supposed to shoot two days later. And they go, there's no way you can have that thing clear in two days. He goes, but how long would it take to make it clear? We go, well, probably about a month. And he goes, all right, we'll save this set and wait a month. And so we took that model, molded it. Gene Rosardi, <laughs> uh, one of the model guys, took it and made this beautiful clear version, which again took forever because you have to use these platinum molds. And it came out tacky, just like the first contact Enterprise did. And so he wound up using regular molds regular rubber molds, and it came out perfect. So that's where this came from. And you don't see it in Nemesis, but I think a fraction of a second. So all of that stuff for nothing. There you go. Well, he was funny when he'd say that. So that we wanted to make T-shirts that said, make it clear. Uh, <laughs> we never got it. <laughs> so there you go. We didn't want to be fired. All right. Well, this has been a really fun episode for me. I love the Sovereign Class Enterprise, as do a majority of our fans. So I think this is going to be one of our favorite Truck Yards episodes for many of the fans out there. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today, John. My pleasure. Anytime. We look forward to many more episodes with you in the future, as you have been a very prolific, uh, very prolific in the world of Star Trek and have designed many, many great ships. Many, 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 many. <laughs> Just have to be at the right place at the right time. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, it's been a great blessing to do it all, and uh, I had a great boss and uh, and all the crew. It was just a magical crew. So when you look at a ship and think it's something I did, it's usually collaboration. So a lot of hands behind the final thing. So uh, I've got to give a give a nod to Herman and Rick Sternbach and all the crew and all the effects guys. So and uh, I don't think I mentioned it, but what what we would do when we draw things, I try not to make things completely finished because I want the next guy to be able to put his thoughts and ideas into it. So it's more collaboration as opposed to a, a one guy thing. So, so it's always fun to see what everyone comes up with. Excellent. Well, Samuel and myself, of course, would like to take, thank you guys, all the fans as well for tuning in. And we really enjoy producing these shows for you guys. We love this stuff and want to make content that we ourselves would want to watch, but it's not easy and it takes well over 12 hours of production time for almost every episode from beginning to finish polished episode. So if you enjoy seeing us every week and would like to help us out by contributing to the show, please do so by heading over to trekyards.com and clicking the donate button. We certainly appreciate all the help you can give. And of course, while there, please watch all of our past episodes. And don't forget to join us on Facebook as well 
and giving that like and subscribe button a click. Okay, until next week, trek on, guys. Right.